Witchcraft is dead and discredited. Are you bent on reviving forgotten horrors? Welcome to Mind Over Splatter, your podcast about horror movies, just for you. We're, we're getting extra British tonight. We just dipped our toes into the Britishness last episode with our Clive Barker talk. We're, now we're going British folklore. We're going to get incredibly disgustingly British. We're all going to do the entire episode with the worst fake British accents you've ever heard for two hours. <laughs> no. No, we're not going to do that. I'm Dylan sipping a cuppa. <laughs> it's a, an afternoon recording. No beer this time around. Coming to you from Montreal. And as usual, we've got William O'Donnell, the man of a thousand voices with us. Hi, Will. Hello. Yes, my voices are renowned for their consistency. So uh, Will uh, just went through puberty this week. We're all very happy for him. Every birthday, yes. It's my birthday this week, and every birthday, uh, puberty just comes rocketing back. It makes it uh, for a very interesting week, very interesting conversations, and uh, very interesting experiences for the male people that uh, come to drop off parcels. <laughs> it's a, it's morning here in Winnipeg for me. I got uh, a big old cup of coffee to uh, help wrap my head around the uh, the baffling affairs of the pagan rituals occurring in England in the 60s and 70s. Lots of bafflement to come. So much bafflement. And lots of rituals. Absolutely. And our third voice, I'm happy to welcome back to the show, David Annandale. Hi there. Hi, David. <laughs> Uh, so David's a senior instructor of film and English with the University of Manitoba and an author. And um, this is the second time on the show. You might recognize his voice from when we did the Kaiju episode. That was a real fun episode. That was so incredibly fun to research. Like, Yeah. So how are you doing today, David? Doing well. Sipping some tea out of a smart mug, which as far as I'm concerned is a form of black magic, the way that thing works. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That has me curious what, what's smart about it. It keeps the tea at a at precisely the same temperature, uh, so it's the unnerving experience of the last drops being just as hot and tasting exactly the same as the first sip. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's witchcraft. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty totally. creepy. Yeah, I officially yeah, right. have goosebumps and <laughs> am feeling inclined to rush over there with a pitchfork and a Bible. That would probably <laughs> for the best. Yeah, so we keep going on about witchcraft because that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about folk horror, uh, occultism, paganism, movies that touch on these things from the period of 1966 to 1974. I'm also going to be patching in an interview related to this with Gary Parsons. Gary Parsons is a filmmaker and a film historian who is a specialist and expert on British witchcraft documentaries from this period. So he's going to help uh, kind of fill out our picture of the fascination with occultism that was going on in Britain at the time that these horror movies we're talking about were being released. So folk horror, perhaps you haven't heard the term folk horror before. It's, I think it's important to point out that nobody was calling the movies folk horror at the time they were released. Right? Nobody was labeling the films and classifying them that way in like 1971 or whatever. They weren't saying, oh, let's go to the new folk horror movie. This is a more recent vintage this term it's really around like 2010 when the term was used by mark gaddis in um, a bbc documentary the history of horror the three-part documentary that uh, he classifies some of the movies we're going to talk about as folk horror that's when it kind of comes into the public consciousness and jonathan rigby uh, who was a re researcher on that show used the term in what book he wrote in 2007 too so what do we mean when we talk about folk horror uh, david how would you define folk horror to somebody who's never heard these two words put together like that yeah. before. Well, it's one of these tricky definitions. And of course, a, any genre definition starts becoming a hard one. And I think your, your point that you just made about it being a, a recent term complicates that still further, right? It's a retroactive definition, so much in the same way that film noir retroactively defined films that weren't called film noir when they first appeared. And then subsequently, you have films that are explicitly that, but with a, a very strong genre awareness. Uh, I kind of like uh, Kayla Janice's definition, I think is a really good core definition. She's just recently released a, a three-hour documentary on uh, folk horror called Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched, 
Yeah, great documentary. And the way she describes it as a horror that is in an isolated or rural environment that deals with older customs or belief systems that have persisted due to this isolation. It gives us, a, I think, a, a good idea to hang on to while being open enough to allow for the vast range of films, whether British or from anywhere else in the world, that feed into the main river of folk horror. Yeah. So that documentary that you mentioned, uh, Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched, that takes a more expansive view of the term, right? Since they're going kind of global. And we're going to be a little bit more specific and focus on specifically British films from the late 60s and early 70s. We're going to be talking about five different movies. Three of them are kind of the definitional folk horror movies. So if you're familiar with this term already, you can probably guess what three of these titles we're going to talk about are. The other two, there might be some surprises in there. But yeah, I think that's a very good definition. And we're talking about folk in the sense of folklore, folk traditions. You can even tie it into the German word folk with a V, which has kind of been sullied by the Nazis, but the ways of people in the woods and the hills. Horror movies that tap into this accretion of knowledge and lifestyles and beliefs that you might not find celebrated on stamps that are are there as if they exist in the landscape and the trees and the rocks and the rivers and things that are pre-modern, that are pre-Christian that are weird in the oldest sense of the term. Eldritch is another fun adjective that you get to bust out in this context. And part of the context for these British films specifically is, like I mentioned, the uh, growing fascination with witchcraft and the occult that was coming out of the counterculture among the young people in Britain at the time. A lot of people started getting really into uh, exploring the pre-Christian rituals of the British islands and or really modern religions that were inspired by those things like Wicca, which was developed by Gerald Gardner in like the 50s and the 60s. And also there's a resurgence in um, the popularity of the writings of Aleister Crowley, the famous occultist who uh, had his religion, Thelema. So we're going to start off with our first movie in uh, 1966, The Witches, actually a Hammer movie, with a script by Nigel Neal, I was happy to include this one and in large part for that reason. I think Nigel Neal is a really uh, interesting guy. Nigel Neal was a, a Manxman who started out writing like short stories and radio plays, but he became one of the first staff writers ever hired by BBC television. When he was hired in 1951, he had never even seen a television, but became kind of a star writer for them when he started writing the Quatermass serials, uh, sort of sci-fi serials that started in 1953. That would have been transmitted live. And his stuff was pretty popular and influential. I've mentioned Nigel Neal on the show before, and maybe not in the first subject you'd expect. I talked about him in the Halloween episode, because Nigel Neal wrote the screenplay for Halloween 3, the season of The Witch, uh, which was the only Hollywood movie that he was attached to, though he had his name removed from the credits because he didn't like what was done with it. John Carpenter was a huge Nigel Neal fan. Though the admiration did not run both ways. Uh, Neil did not like Carpenter, perhaps because of that experience. After Carpenter made Prince of Darkness, which was very Neil inspired and had several Neil references, Neil took to the Observer to write, with an homage like this, who needs insults? I was not a fan. I don't know exactly why Neil wanted his name removed from the film, because it seems very similar to the other movies he made in England in a good way, like Halloween 3, I mean. Because it has that characteristic blending of superstition and science, like kind of hard sci-fi elements and the spooky supernatural stuff at the same time, you know, taking bits of Stonehenge and ancient pagan magic, interfacing them with computers and televisions. You see that in a lot of Neil things like um, one of my favorite, The Stone Tape, which was a BBC uh, Christmas ghost story from 1972. In the 70s, the BBC used to always put out a ghost story movie on Christmas. Uh, And that one is a haunted house story, but it also involves the science where audio engineers discover that the stones in this Victorian mansion are recording like a tape, these tragic events that had happened in the past, kind of folk horror-ish in the sense that you have the events that have happened in the past in a certain area get absorbed and then can influence the modern era. So this is just deleted to the subject of 1966's The Witches, which was based on a book by Nora Lofts called The Devil's Own. And like I mentioned, it was a Hammer movie. So um, if you don't know, Hammer Films was making 
most of the horror movies or many of the horror movies in the UK at this time, starting in the late 50s, Hammer started making like Dracula movies, Frankenstein movies, the ones with Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. I think some of the later folk horror movies that we're going to get into can be seen as kind of a reaction against those more old school, gothic, cheesier horror movies with characters who are popularized in the 30s and the 40s. But this one is actually a movie that was produced by Hammer, though it's not the old vampire in the castle thing. So The Witches, David, you mentioned that this movie has a lot of the elements that could almost form like a template for some of the later movies. Yeah. What do you mean by that? What's going on in this movie? Well, we have Joan Fontaine as a, a school teacher who's traumatized by uh, events in, in Africa. That that particular uh, detail of the film probably you know is one of those things that has hasn't dated particularly well. But the meat of the matter and the part that works the best sees her moving back to England and taking up a new position as a school teacher in a small town, village I should say, where she gradually becomes aware of witchcraft practices underway. So it's got a lot of the overall sense of the outsider coming into the community and discovering the, the strange secrets that are underway and the sense of the these old traditions that have persisted or been revived to ill effect. Perhaps one of the significant differences between it and The Wicker Man is the suggestion that there is an actual supernatural force at work here, rather than simply the examination of the belief systems. and. Uh, as an aside, I'd also mention we can almost bracket the period that we're looking at with Nigel Neal works in that his final Quatermass script, simply titled Quatermass, which aired on television in 1979, very much is folk horror with sort of pagan rituals, but it's also tied into UFOs harvesting us for food. So very much the kind of combination that you mentioned before, but an even more explicitly rural sense, so almost a full circle here with Neal's work. But with the witches, we have the rituals, we have the secrets, we have the old magic being used to, to cure people, but also to throw curses on them. Pretty much all the motifs are there, and also the location, right? We have a much stronger sense of an actual location here than in the traditional Gothic Hammer films, which tend to be much more studio-bound. Here we actually feel the sense of the village and the environments around it. So it's not as expansive a view of the natural world as we would get in the core canonical folk horror trilogy that we're going to get to, but it's we definitely have a stronger sense of actual location than we do in you know, The Curse of Frankenstein or uh, Dracula, Prince of Darkness. There's that power of the one where like the Wicker Man has an influential leader, but uh, in the witches, we have someone whose actual literal supernatural power seems to control the entire community, which sort of really gets truly revealed by the ending, like by removing that one source of supernatural power, people seem to come out of like a hypnosis that, you know, the Reverend kind of goes back to preaching or working as a pastor, whatever it might be, but remains in this community that seems to have been healed. This one does have also an interesting distinction of two different versions of, or two approaches rather, to the fear of the other. There's the fear of an outsider, like you're coming into a community and things seem very strange and they might be, you know, fearful of your influence on it, although they don't appear as fearful. But the use of the the witch doctor and the visions, it has um, that very unique point of the only one that uses the fear of like another culture like a completely and utterly foreign one, like not a historical one in Europe, but something from elsewhere. And no other of the films that we're talking about seem to include like a different, but it's very much was implanting that fear of something foreign that traumatized her. Yeah, and it does create this sense of the, the pre-existing uh, weakness or fragility in the protagonist giving us a character who's already recovering from something uh, and you know, not an unusual trope in horror, right? Where they, you know, some terrible thing has happened to someone. So they go someplace to recover and it turns out to be the worst place in the world for them to go. But we also see the inner strength of, of Joan Fontaine's character come out as well, which I also wanted to pick up on what you said about the, the vicar, because we have here as in the wicker man, the sense of Christianity being the, the absence Right? because especially since we have the guy wearing the the dog collar but it turns out he's not a priest at all 
Yeah. He's just mm-hmm. he's just cosplaying. Yeah, he uh, just likes to wear it. <laughs> you know, he just yeah, it makes him feel nice. And so the the, the church itself is simply essentially a, a stage setting. This is a village that no longer has a Christian component. This older form has sort of reasserted itself or excluded the newer religion, if you will. And so it, that that becomes sort of one of the markers within the the context of the film as you know this place as being different and, and unnerving. And on top of that, I think we've got something interesting with the Kay Walsh character, who on the one hand she does map onto the Christopher Lee figure from The Wicker Man, except the fact that she is the leader is the reveal, right? Mm-hmm. Lee calls himself the enlightened pagan, right? And so she is that too, in that she's she's an anthropologist, she's a scholar of this material who has discovered that, oh, it actually works. And so for most of the film, she appears to be the voice of reason. She's the hard-headed rationalist that Joan Fontaine turns to for help. And so it's the it's his added betrayal when she turns out to be the head of the coven. That's right, it gets fascinating. I see what we admit we believe and what we believe, I suppose, could destroy us. Oh, beautifully put. Yeah, I, I also find it really fascinating the way that they included that prologue of, of her in Africa. It's almost like she picks up a susceptibility to to superstition and to seeing the reality in witchcraft like it was a tropical illness that she acquires in a, in a foreign country. I find it interesting to compare that to the way that a lot of these people who started uh, or were very influential in the revival of paganism and witchcraft in England at this time were initially inspired by um, belief systems that they had encountered in places that England had colonized. Uh, Gerald Gardner was abroad for most of his career, working as a civil servant. Aleister Crowley also traveled widely, and you know they studied religions in India and places. From a certain angle, you could see England acquiring its taste for the occult from people who had been to these other countries. And uh, I think there's a neat comparison to uh, Joan Fontaine initially being in Africa and kind of discovering a susceptibility to witchcraft there that she brings back with her when she returns to England and kind of can't shake. And also at the end, not only does the town seem to be unbewitched by the loss of their leader, also the installation of a PA system in the school, apparently. I find it interesting that they like highlight that they put a loudspeaker system in the school. I, don't know, I wondered if that's like a bittersweet ending, like the local traditions are kind of being drowned out by mass culture enabled by new technology now. And that's that's the solution. That's the cure. He said the you know, civilization technology is roots out the old stuff uh, here, a reversal from what you'd get with something like the stone tapes then. That's uh, true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But here, it's, it's the sign of uh, the the return to the normal, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I know within the film itself, it was some sort of callback because the uh, cosplay vicar was uh, working on something like that before. And I think he just got to sort of finish his work and do it in a different way. And But I think it's uh, far more greater a symbol, as you say, yeah. the technology drowning out. The right, there's that the moment world. where he seems to be playing the organ and you realize he's playing a... Yeah, recording of an organ instead yeah. or something. Yeah, He's, there's. I'm sure there's a lot of other layers to perhaps uh, dig through mm-hmm. there. Of the, the the cosplaying vicar is not only not who he seems in, in in every aspect of their life. They're not actually a vicar. They're not actually a, a musician. Like nothing about them is true. They're a figurehead in all senses. That all they can do is put on a fake collar and play a tape, and then have the appearance of a uh, a religious leader. Yeah. Well, it does become. I think something of a of a thread, the ineffectual nature of Christianity in these films, right? Whether it's mm-hmm. hypocrisy, there's a weakness in that that particular faith has no purchase in these films. Joan Fontaine defeats Kay Walsh not uh, with a crucifix, but by playing along the same rules as. Uh, Walsh's belief, right? She disrupts the ritual according to its own rules. It's not holy water or an exorcism or anything like that. It's true. It's not a Christian victory. In fact, it it implies that they haven't expunged the the paganism from there. So as they continue living there, that magic is, is still there. Theoretically, they could also start playing by those rules and create the rituals again and gain that power again. Right. So the, the our cosplaying vicar, the fact that from when we see him until the reveal that he isn't a vicar, we believe that he is, mm-hmm. suggesting that is it 
erasing the difference? Is it suggesting that it doesn't really matter whether he is or not? The fact that he wore that dog collar, we kind of took him at face value and therefore as a reassuring figure, when in fact he's just a hollow shell, Mm -hmm. Mm. just like the church, the, the physical building is a hollow shell, is that telling of what he represents, right? That that's just not going to be the way out here, which it is in quite a few other Hammer films. You know, Taste the Blood of Dracula. Dracula is destroyed that time by accidentally smashing a stained glass window, right? The mere iconography, the painted reproductions of the religion are enough to destroy him. Whereas here, all of the paraphernalia is just that paraphernalia. Yeah, that's really Mm -hmm. interesting. I also just want to say before I move on that I really love Joan Fontaine in this role. I think it's really good casting. And this was her last film role, surprisingly. Mm. Um, She also was the one who acquired the rights for the book to make it into a film. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm. That's interesting. I I really do like Joan Fontaine a lot and everything she does. Uh, The Hitchcock movies and Letter from an Unknown Woman. I I just love the way she kind of has bad posture and seems kind of shy and insecure, but also seems to be kind of privately mirthful about everything that's happening around her. She's she's like the introvert's screen queen and uh, (laughs) was great in this role. Stop that, Richard. What? What you're thinking? (laughs) What am I thinking? Ungodly thoughts of your Sarah, that's my guess. Thoughts of Sarah, yes. Ungodly. Depends on how you look at it. Okay, so I'd like to move on to the first uh, chronologically of the three definitional folk horror movies, Witchfinder General, which came out in 1968. When Vincent Price arrived at the airport in London to film this movie, the director, Michael Reeves, wasn't there to meet him. And he kind of expected this. Word had already reached Price that Reeves didn't want him for the part. And uh, though Reeves had only made two movies at this point and was only 24 years old, this upstart director was already developing a reputation for being a difficult and demanding guy. So the veteran Price reportedly sneered to the producer who came to pick him up, take me to your goddamn young genius. And things didn't improve much on set. There was tons of tension between Price and Reeves during the shooting of the movie. Price had been accustomed to acting his way in the AIP, uh, American International Pictures horror movies he'd been making for a while. And he was bristling at this temperamental young director who kept harrying him with demands and unclear instructions. At one point, Price had had enough and he decided to upraid Reeves in front of the cast and crew. And he said... Young man, I have made 87 films. What have you done? To which Reeves replied, I've made two good ones. A few months after Witchfinder General premiered, Michael Reeves was found dead from a drug overdose at age 25. And to his two good ones, he'd added a brilliant third film. I'm a big fan of Witchfinder General. But let's back up a little bit. I want to talk about Michael Reeves a little bit more because even though he only made three films, I find him a really fascinating guy. Uh, the scion of a British paint manufacturing family. He was obsessed with like hard-edged American movies from a young age. His idol was Don Siegel, you know, who made like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the Lee Marvin version of The Killers. Uh, so much so that when his family took him on a vacation to Boston when he was a teenager, <laughs> Michael Reeves ran off, took a plane to Los Angeles, went to Don Siegel's home address and knocked on his door asking for a job. Siegel let him oversee dialogue on test shoots for the the Elvis Western Flaming Star. But that intensity got him into the director's chair at a young age. His first movie was The She-Beast with Barbara Steele, also known as Revenge of the Blood Beast, which was a, a, a cheapie. It was only shot in four days, but a movie that I really liked. And then a second movie was The Sorcerers with Boris Karloff. I think is an awesome movie, um, kind of a swing in London counterculture movie where there's an old couple who find a way to take control of the mind and body of one of the young guys. So it invites all kinds of interesting interpretations. Really, really interesting movie. The Sorceress was produced by Tony Tenser's Tygon Pictures who would uh, also produce Witchfinder General. So Tensor was a publicist turned producer of uh, sleazy and scary movies. As a publicist, he'd sold British Bardo to UK audiences. He coined the term sex kitten. And he also brought Roman Polanski to the UK to film a repulsion. 
Tensor had bought the rights to the historical novel Witchfinder General by Ronald Bassett after reading a galley copy. And this was the story of Matthew Hopkins, a notorious witch hunter from the time of the English Civil War in the 1640s. So a real person, this Matthew Hopkins. And it sounds like the real person was as nasty of a piece of work as the character that we get played by Vincent Price. Between 1644 and 1646, the real-world Hopkins is believed to have been responsible for the executions of over 100 witches. That's more witch executions than Britain had seen in the previous 100 years, it's believed. And also the book he wrote, The Discovery of Witches, was an inspiration for witch hunts in the New England colonies in following years. So Reeves and his writing partner Tom Baker were assigned to write a script inspired by the general idea of Witchfinder General. And originally, they imagined a version of Matthew Hopkins that would be a little more uh, inadequate and ridiculous. They wanted him to be played by Donald Pleasance. But then um, Samuel Z. Arkov's American International Pictures, who made tons of, uh, of genre movies and horror movies in the 50s and 60s and, and 70s and distributed a bunch of movies, they became involved with the production. They wanted their man, Vincent Price, who'd already made 16 films with AIP at this point, to be Matthew Hopkins. Reeves was furious because he's one of these guys who didn't like the hammer movies who was trying to come up with new ways to make horror movies that were not that he saw as cheesy or campy like the price movies but there was nothing he could do about it so he rewrote the character matthew hopkins to be the kind of cold domineering figure that could be played by price that we get in the movie so the movie witchfinder general this is like i mentioned it's one of the three movies that are kind of definitional folk horror but it's kind of different from the other movies here too in a lot of ways, um, I feel like it's it's basically a spaghetti Western set during the English Civil War instead of the American Civil War. Cruel characters taking advantage of the power vacuum, horses riding through the wilderness, tavern brawls, gunfights, public execution with you know a tracking shot across the faces of the spectators, uneasy alliances between amoral actors. It's basically like a Sergio Corbucci movie, but wearing a doublet and a leather jerkin (laughs) beautiful nature shots incredible energy and it also just drips with sadism and cruelty Uh, the movie was retitled the conqueror worm when it was released by aap in the u.s because they wanted to make it part of their edgar Allan poe series even though it obviously had nothing to do with poe but that's never stopped a horror movie producer before (laughs) and they had uh, vincent price read a few lines from the poem the conqueror worm over the intro and the outro to loosely tie it in. Uh, in the U.S., The Conqueror Worm was released on a double bill with The Young, The Evil, and The Savage, which is the English dub of the Italian film Nude Si Muere, Naked You Die, directed by Antonio Margariti. Ancora? Margariti. Not that many people saw it in the U.S., but in the U.K. it did surprisingly well and was a bit of a sensation, and lots of people wrote about it at the time it was released including uh, the playwright Alan Bennett, who had a popular column where he talked about movies in the UK weekly, The Listener. He used it to attack Witchfinder General and to attack some other critics who had said positive things about it by calling it just a, you know, a grotesque, sadistic movie. Um, he said that it was a degrading experience by which I mean it made me feel dirty. And he argued that horror movies should always be balanced out with comedy. And uh, the next issue of The Listener Reeves responded with his own letter, where uh, he said that if the violence in the movie makes you feel awful, that's the point. He wrote, surely the most immoral thing any form of entertainment can do is the conditioning of the audience to accept and enjoy violence. And he added, I wish I could have witnessed Bennett frantically attempting to wash away the dirty feeling my film gave him. It would have been proof of the fact that Witchfinder General works as intended. Uh, It was also quite popular in Germany, where uh, it helped inspire a vogue for West German witch hunting movies. And uh, Price ended up actually liking the movie when he finally saw it, uh, despite all the difficulties on set, and wrote a 10-page letter to uh, Michael Reeves praising the film and saying that now he understood what he was going for. And Reeves carried that letter with him, apparently, until the end, which was not too far away. It was in February of 69 that he was found dead from an overdose of barbiturates and alcohol, uh, apparently an accidental overdose. So... (laughs) One of the reasons why I say Witchfinder General is quite different from some of the other movies is that there's no witchcraft in the movie at all. There's nothing actually occult going on. There are many people being accused of witchcraft, 
but they're not even really accused of using black magic or anything. They're mostly just accused of being papists. So basically, being, just, they stand accused of Catholicism mostly. It's largely about the sadism of this this sinister power figure. Matthew Hopkins. And also there's a lot of tension between the relationship that he has with Stern, the man that he works with, who is also as sadistic, if not more sadistic than him. But they have that tension because Stern comes off as less cultivated and more nakedly sadistic. So he um, doesn't really like the condescension of, of Price's Hopkins character. Hopkins is disgusted by how blatant a Stern sadism is. There's a, just a lot of exceptional cruelty and unexpected twist in the story. It's a, a, a rollicking adventure a full of gorgeous shots of the natural world that not that I'd say aren't like really a juxtaposition of the beauty of the natural world. Reveling in the nature is showing that I th- it's a very, very cynical movie. And I think Reeves is showing this kind of sadism and the cruelty of power as being natural. Just just as natural as the trees and the hills, that this is the way the world is. The ending, of course, drives home. It's just such a, a nihilistic ending. If there's a, ever such a thing as an uh, atheist recruitment agency, I would uh, take this film and uh, Mark of the Devil and present them to people. Because then, oh boy, do you start to loathe Christianity after watching <laughs> uh, Both those films uh, had the same effect on me in that I just felt sick throughout and after. And really, it takes me a while to shake that feeling. And uh, this one really compounds that by having two very sharp forms of tyranny opposing each other and also overpowering everyone around them. We've got this tyranny of religion and of military bullying. And it was really interesting to see them clash, like in the scene where they tried to take the horses from the witch finder and his, and his uh, uh, Sancho Panzo just to see these two bullying figures who both think they have, you know, the top card go at each other and use their smugness against each other. Cause that's what seems to really carry a lot of it. Every time they arrive in, they arrive thinking they've already won whatever they're trying to do. It could be the most petty thing. It could be just trying to find a local tavern. They're smug about finding that. And the weaponized faith is such an ugly, ugly thing. And it's used to great effect like Christianity is the weaponized faith in here. Like we have other films where destruction, death and pain is created through, uh, you know, pagan rituals, uh, witchcraft or the, or just the belief of it. Whereas here it's, it's Christianity that is causing the harm. And uh, as you had mentioned, there is no real witchcraft going on. The closest hints we get to anything like that is the list, the, the fake accusations, the evidence rather, of of some people talking to their quote unquote familiars, which meant that they said that they were saying things to a black cat. And that was enough reason to then take the soldier and his wife and torture them and uh, ultimately try to execute them, which was only amplified by the aftermath where the kids are then cooking potatoes (laughs) right, right, in in the the ashes ashes of this uh, innocent woman's cremation site. It's a very effective film. Vincent Price is very good. He's weirdly reserved at times. And that's one of the main points of contentions that happened on set, apparently, between Reeves and Price, was that Reeves was trying to get him to be more reserved, was trying to force him to be more subtle mm-hmm. and, uh, and to break his usual habits of you know camping it up a little bit. And he, I think he got that out of him, and it does work. Yeah, a, a very effective film. So many uh, very memorable moments. There's just so much instability And like Christianity has the cure for that instability, but it's not obviously used correctly. It's just used for this aristocratic sadist is able to have enough conviction that they find themselves in this completely fictional job. Like they just make up a job that doesn't exist. And then they get to live that life going town to town, collecting huge bounties, like the the amounts that they keep paying him for it when they they actually do a price comparison of like, how much does a horse cost? Versus how much does this witch finder make for burning one person? It was it was insane. If you doing the math on it, not that the you know the math of the money was the most exciting part of the film, no, <laughs> but still, it did help hammer in just how much influence they had. That he can walk in with his kind of conviction and say that what I do is worth this amount. So it did allow the real Matthew Hopkins to retire in comfort, right? So yeah. 
Yeah, he died from tuberculosis, I think. Also died at uh, no older than 28. He was never actually the old man, as portrayed by Vincent Price. But If Christianity doesn't get a, a look in in the witches and is essentially just paraphernalia, then it's the other way around in Witchfinder General. I mean, this is set during the uh, English Civil War, so it's uh, not just a battle between the monarch and parliamentarians, but also an internecine uh, war with, within Christianity. So it's the, the, the two competing strains there that are creating this chaos. And Price's, um, Hopkins clearly doesn't have any particular beliefs in what he's doing. It's just uh, a good way to, to force women to have sex with him and to make money. Right? There, there's very little, if any, actual belief in what he's doing or in the guilt of the people. So there's no sense really of the isolated community with the old beliefs that have persisted. Rather, these are isolated communities that are victimized by the knowing outsider who is twisting essentially current beliefs to his, his own ends. And I, I thought, Dylan, your point about the use of nature was, was good too. It, it is different from what we see in the, the other films, but perhaps showing that uh, humanity is also red in tooth and claw, but also a kind of juxtaposition uh, as we get in the opening scene, right, of the you know the beautiful rolling hills and the sheep and then the scaffold being built for, for the execution. So you have this very sylvan backdrop for all the horrible things that are happening. But it's not like nature itself impinges at all on the awareness of the characters or that they have any role to play with it. It's just the landscape through which they traverse and in which they perform their drama, as opposed to the deep connections that we then will see in The Wicker Man between the, the belief systems that are at work there and nature and the, the need for nature to flourish, or in Blood on Satan's Claw, where it's a very emphatic fact of life in everything the characters are doing. And Will, you mentioned Mark of the Devil, and I think this is, is striking too. And we think of our, our core trilogy, in some ways, Witchfinder General is almost the, the odd man out. Its direct influences, the films that imitate it, would be things like Mark of the Devil or Paul Nash's Inquisition. Thematically, it seems to be going in a rather different direction from the other films that we perhaps think of as more typically folk horror, right? Even though it clearly is, is this important text. I think this is also a pattern that we're, we see with this trilogy in that we keep getting two of them are like each other and the third one isn't. So... Mm -hmm. Two of them don't have supernatural. One of them does. Two of them are produced by Tygon. One of them isn't. Uh, two of them are set in the past. One set in the modern day. Two of them have Patrick Wymark in the cast. One of them <laughs> <Yep>. doesn't. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, I'm being a little bit facetious, but on the other hand, it does highlight how difficult it is to nail down what folk horror is when we have, mm. it's hard to find a, a lot of commonality between all three of the films that are, are mentioned as the, the holy trinity of folk horror. Yeah, absolutely. Very true, very true. And I just wanted to mention those lovely nature shots were uh, shot by cinematographer uh, John Coquillon, or Coquillon, not sure how to pronounce his name. He's a Dutchman who um, lived in Africa for years shooting uh, wildlife documentaries. So he was recommended to the production because he was so proficient with using natural light and filming outdoors quickly and efficiently. It was his first uh, movie, but he did shot a lot of Sam Peckinpah movies after this. And just to quickly kind of frame it in terms of the resurgence and uh, occult beliefs in Britain at the time, a lot of the new religions that are being created, the new neo-paganism religions, took as gospel the idea that's um, that's called the witch cult hypothesis, which is the idea that some archaeologists had in the 20th century that there were actual beliefs in paganism and witchcraft that had persisted into the early modern era. And that when witches were being persecuted, it's Christians were persecuting people who actually had continued to practice witchcraft. This is considered now to be a discredited theory because there's no supporting evidence for that. But a lot of the folk horror movies, uh, like the neo-paganist movements, take that as truth that there was this continuity through the Christian era after the Christianization of Europe of people still practicing these old witchcraft beliefs. But Witchfinder General doesn't, right? Because again, as we've mentioned a number of times, there is no witchcraft in the movie. That This is not a movie that's endorsing that witch cult hypothesis. Okay, so before we head off into the increasingly occult films to follow, now would be time for that interview. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm talking with Gary Parsons, a filmmaker and a film historian and something of an expert on the British witchcraft documentaries. Gary, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me on the program. So we're talking about uh, folk horror and witchcraft movies from the late 60s and the 70s. But of course, the horror movies, the fictional movies, that's only part of the picture. There's maybe a lesser known side of this record of British occultism and paganism and witchcraft from this time. And that's the documentaries. There were witchcraft documentaries coming out of this time, too. What are these witchcraft documentaries that we started seeing around this period? Um, there was a few of them. Um, well, to be fair with you, there's about three or four major ones. There was uh, one called Legend of the Witches, which is probably the most well-known one, and another one called Secret Rites. Now, they, they've got a very odd history to them, which basically bleeds into all the counterculture sort of thing that was going on within the late 60s and the early 70s. Secret Rites is a film that was made actually as a tax loss film here in the UK. The actual copy we have of the film, which is the only existing copy at the moment, it misses 45 minutes of the footage. We've only got half the film. And the bizarre thing about it is the guy who made the film decided that he was going to sort of put it out, but add some pornography in amongst the, the witchcraft rituals as well. So it was sold to Europe as a pornography film, whereas in the UK it was shown as a documentary. What year is this? 1971. The, the thing is, these films all contain a British couple called Alex and Maxine Sanders. Now, Alex was um, self-proclaimed, if you want to call it that, king of the witches at the time in Britain. And he sort of comes to the fore because of the counterculture revolution that was happening within the UK at that time, the same as happening in the States. He becomes kind of like a media celebrity. Like he goes on television talking about witchcraft, you know, um, there's interviews with him in national newspapers. Always with his wife, who was considerably younger than him, normally posing naked in a field somewhere or whatever else, doing a witchcraft ritual. They basically use these films as a way of spreading the witchcraft word. Now, Legend of the Witches, which is the longer film and the only existing full print film we have from the British witchcraft documentaries phase, is probably the most interesting one. It was filmed in black and white, lasts over 100 minutes, and includes rituals that Alex and Maxine performed uh, with their coven at the time, along with a basic history of witchcraft. So the film actually discusses witchcraft in very much a formal documentary manner, a voiceover being given explaining the roots and history of witchcraft, and then you get the visual performances of Alex and Maxine and their coven doing stuff out in the woods, all these things have to be staged because of the way they were lit and the way they were filmed at the time. So they were kind of, you know, real and unreal ceremonies that are being filmed within this movie. It was originally released here as a film on its own right. And then because it kind of didn't make the money they were expecting it to, it was then put on in Soho cinemas. Now, Soho cinemas in the UK were well known for pornographic films. So it was kind of sold as that. And then... It was later re-released as a double feature with a soft core pornographic film as well, in which case the film was actually edited down to it a shorter running length. So for many years, we only had the shorter version of the film, and it was only about two or three years ago that the final full-length copy was found and restored of it. These films have a very, very checkered history. The other documentaries were made for British television at the time. So there's about two of those that were made around about similar times. So they never got cinema screenings, but they were certainly uh, important enough that these documentaries are starting to be made for British television as well. And the documentaries for the British TV, you're looking more at um, them looking at it as within a, a folklore issue and then the old thing about uh, mixing witchcraft with Satanism, which is always the big problem. Most documentaries at the time had, they couldn't sort of separate the two. They didn't understand that witchcraft was a totally different religion than Satanism or devil worship was. And so this blends in with fictional cinema releases like The Wicker Man and Blood and Satan's Claw, now known as the folk horror genre. You've got this kind of cross-pollination between documentaries and fictional films that sort of happen all at the same time. And this happens with a big, big resurgence here in the UK of interest in the occult and in witchcraft in general. These films fill in a gap 
these movies are like like something's held in amber, you know, that they're, they're very much a product of their time. And that's what's so very special about them. How do we get there where we have uh, such a fascination with the witchcraft and the occult at that period? How do we get from the counterculture and hippies and stuff like that to witchcraft? Why do you think that happens at that time? Um, in the 50s and things, there was a guy called Gerald Gardner who invented gardenerianism and witchcraft. Um, he used to be on occasionally on TV. He was an old guy with a long white beard and you know, very talked like he was uh, some sort of sergeant major from another era sort of thing. And then you get Alex and Maxine, who are a very modern couple. That makes them a bit more cooler. And Alex creates Alexandrianism, which is a, a separate thing to the Gardnerianism. So a separate form of witchcraft. What happens is it kickstarts about 1966 You've got to remember, witchcraft laws in the UK weren't reprieved until about 1952 or three. You know, if you're practicing witchcraft up until that point, you could be taken to court and tried for it. But when the counterculture blossoms, there's a lot of reprints of, of books. Rock music informs a lot of this, I have to say. The Beatles put Alistair Crowley on the front cover of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band because John Lennon had discovered a Crowley book in a bookstore called Indica in, in London and kind of became fascinated by him. There was also a big move towards like Eastern religions as well, like again, the Beatles go to India for the Maharishi and all that kind of thing. So it all kind of blends in with this thing of, of rejecting what your parents had before. So your parents predominantly in the UK would have been Christian. So it's like that kind of rejection of finding yourself. It wasn't just the Beatles, there were bands like the Incredible String Band who were doing this folk get back to nature kind of thing within their music, talking about folk imagery from the past and witches as well. There's a song they do called Witch's Hat. The Rolling Stones did their Satanic Majesty's Request. So there was a real kind of cachet around the occult and witchcraft here. It suddenly became a very, very cool thing. When you look at Secret Rites and you see Alex and Maxine's coven, they're people in their 20s. They're not 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, they're all predominantly very young people. That's really where it begins. We also have in Britain underground newspapers, countercultural newspapers like It and Oz, that also was starting to discuss about witchcraft. There was a big shop, a magazine, and a, a, a centre people could go to in London called Gandalf's Garden, and they were promoting, again, articles on witchcraft mixed in with Eastern philosophy. So there's a kind of a blending between ancient British beliefs and witchcraft beliefs, if you want, you know, because some of them aren't very ancient, and Eastern philosophy as well. So people were kind of trying to find their way, I think, and sometimes in some really quite muddy waters, to be fair. And I expect a lot of a lot of those who couldn't be bothered to jump on the hippie trail to India decided they were going to stay here and investigate this. And in Britain, it doesn't take very much suddenly for everyone to sort of Somebody want to be dancing around fires naked and shouting out, you know, chants or whatever else, especially when there's times of turmoil, which again, the 60s were. The 60s were a time of turmoil. For like these young people who are, you know, rejecting Christianity, rejecting their parents' values, I guess, yeah. what do you think they're seeing in, in witchcraft that maybe is offering something different? Like you mentioned the, the connection to nature, which I think is interesting, uh, definitely at a time where... You know, we're at the very start of like environmentalism. Yeah. What do you think they're seeing here in the witchcraft that they did not see in Christianity in the traditional ways? Okay, what they're seeing is that it's not a repressive form of religion. And so you've got to remember, you know, we're, we're in the era of free love and all that kind of thing happening as well. Christianity would be telling you not to, not to, not to. Witchcraft is opening it up, you know. And the other thing is, even though you have the high priest and the high priestess in witchcraft, it's not very hierarchical. Everyone is there and you're all there together as a group because without you being a group, it doesn't work together. And the other thing is the fact of you've got to remember that witchcraft involves women as well. You know, and the fact of a lot of women joined because they felt that it was a voice for them, that it was inclusive of them. You know, they could be the high priest or they could be leading a ritual, etc. Here you go, you've got this religion that says it can trace itself back hundreds of thousands of years, you know, back to the, the dawning of Stonehenge, et cetera, et cetera, even though it can't, uh, but, you know, they can claim it can. And it's also inclusive to you, and you're feeling part of a bigger group. And that's why 
over the years, obviously, that the church here in the UK has had to sort of become a little bit more mild in what it's saying and doing because they suddenly realised that lots of people were being converted, no matter how many uh, vicars and priests they put on TV telling you that witchcraft was evil because it was being inclusive and it nature worship and allegedly the true religion of the British Isles because Christianity was an imported religion. At the same time in the UK, you get a, a resurgence of interest in King Arthur and you know all the Arthurian tales. Glastonbury becomes the hub centre for hippies to go to, on, on spiritual quests to in the UK. Then we start having the Glastonbury Fair, which also turns into the Glastonbury Festival. So, you know, it's 1970, 71. It's all connected with ley lines and, again, the history of the tour and the fact of many people involved with the occult lived in Glastonbury, like Dion Fortune and all these kind of people. At what point did it stop growing? Is there a moment where the movement kind of lost steam or the, the wave broke? Yeah, it started really waning about 1974 in the UK. I because mean, it's, it's a kind of like a slow decline, but it doesn't decline totally. You know, there's always people who are involved with it, so it never goes away. But what happens is, is that it becomes less sensational. Films don't get really get made about it, discussing it. Um, magazines don't cover it and papers don't cover it. Before this, I mean, you think the early 70s, there used to be a magazine that you could go and buy in your local newsstand in the UK here called Witchcraft Magazine. That was, you know, effectively a mixture between interviews and, and again, titillation, to be fair. It was like a top shelf magazine at the time. So, yeah, so it kind of tales of about 74, 75. Here in the UK, the music scene changes at that point as well. There's a dwindling in esoteric subject matter within within rock music as we start getting up and coming bands that end up becoming like punk bands. Punk wants to get rid of hippies. Basically, they see all this this kind of witchcraft stuff and esoteric stuff is something that's left over from the, the hippie period. In the last few years, again, there's been a resurgence of interest in witchcraft. So it's only now that some of these people from that period are coming out of the woodwork now. I mean, we're not when I do talks, I said people from Alex and Maxine's Coven will come along to me and discuss with me afterwards, you know, and they, and they sort of said, oh, this is the first time in 30 years I've talked about this or something like that or 40 years or whatever it is. I agree with you that there seems to be like a lot more interest in witchcraft over the past few years during the pandemic, especially we saw in sites like TikTok, uh, witchcraft became very popular among a lot of young people. Anytime that there's worrying things that are happening in the world, witchcraft seems to have a little bit of a resurgence. Well, this has been really fascinating. Uh, and Gary, for people who are interested in looking for your work, where might they find that? Um, I have a website, which is uh, thelamafilms.com. But if you want to see, most of my movies are up on Vimeo. You should be able to see them on there. Right, so uh, the uh, the next one in this central trilogy of folk horror films is Blood on Satan's Claw, which came out in the year 1971. Uh, David, tell us something about that. Well, we could almost make the case that Blood on Satan's Claw is the folk horror film that perhaps is the greatest number of progeny down the road, in that it is the film that has the supernatural. It kind of has it both ways as far as the witch cult hypothesis that you just mentioned, it definitely is present here while bringing in some of the nastiness of Witchfinder General. In our three films, we have a kind of Witchfinder figure. In the first, he's the villain. In the third, he's the victim. And here, he's the debatable hero. Uh, hmm. So this was another Tygon production and very much made in the wake of Witchfinder General. In fact, we can see the ripple effects of that film was. So for instance, the fact that Witchfinder General was an expensive film by Tygon standards meant that there wasn't a lot of money for Blood Beast Terror, which was being made at the same time. And the Tygon executives, because Witchfinder General was so successful, insisted on a witch dunking scene in Blood on Satan's Claw. So this was originally written as an, an anthology film and then rewritten, but a lot of the anthology aspects were still kept there, right? So a woman confined to an attic room, children in a cult, and a man cutting his own hand off, which perhaps explains, I think there is a, 
an admirable coherence to the film, but at the same time, an odd patchwork quality where the characters you think are going to be the main characters turn out not to be. And it is a, a kind of mosaic of events in this, this village. So uh, Piers Haggard was brought in to direct, and he and screenwriter Robert Wynne Simmons uh, reworked Wynne Simmons' original uh, screenplay. The Tygon executives also insisted on a couple of other changes. One, the original screenplay's ending, which had Patrick Weimark's judge character come in with a militia to exterminate the entire village to get rid of the cult. Certainly, when you think of the line in the film when he says, be warned, I will come back using undreamed of measures, that really does seem to be the undreamed of measure he was referring to. But the other thing that I think was a really good move was changing the original time period of the script, which was the Victorian era, and then the sense that they felt that, okay, that's been overdone, which, I mean, that was Hammer's bread and butter. So what instead uh, we get is an early 18th century setting. So it's later than Witchfinder General, but earlier than most of the typical Gothic horrors coming out of Britain uh, at this period, and also creates an interesting dynamic where we are at the beginnings of the Enlightenment, and we feel that so there's a very, very strong sense of both the persistence of old slash outdated beliefs, the arrival of reason and rationality, and they're colliding here. The judge, who is a very interesting figure, is initially very dismissive of the, the witchcraft uh, or the, the demon possession that seems to be going on. And we have a doctor who is very conscious of the fact that you know, he says, we have so much to learn, right, that he's doing what he can for people who are unwell, but he really has no idea if any of the stuff works or not. But the fact that he is conscious of the fact that there's just so much he doesn't know, I think, is another marker of the period that we're getting here. And the, the plot, in a nutshell, has a laborer accidentally unearth some evil corpse we don't get a very good look at it. There's a, a skull with an eye and some skin and fur. And this unearthing, and I say unearthing advisedly because our opening shots really emphasize the ground in, in extreme close-up uh, being dug up. And that thing spreads its evil throughout the village and it manifests itself in all sorts of ways, but primarily in a demon cult led by Linda Hagen, all the children, the teenagers of the village are become part of this cult. Murder runs rampant until Patrick Weimark's judge returns with brutal methods to put an end to the cult. Patrick Weimark in his final role, too. Like you mentioned, he was in uh, in Witchfinder. He, he played Cromwell in Witchfinder in a little kind of cameo, but um, he had a heart attack before this film's release. But uh, yeah, really interesting character. Yeah, and simultaneously deeply unpleasant, right? I mean, the yeah. <laughs> I think this is one of the interesting ways the film keeps shifting, right? Because in the first act, you figure, okay, he's the villain. He's so full of himself. He's so down on our young lovers who are clearly going to be our protagonists. <laughs> Right, And then instead, the young woman is possessed and leaves the film, never to be seen again, 15 minutes in, or, <laughs> or, or thereabouts. Her young man, who looks like he's going to be the hero, he's got all the earmarks of the hero, cuts his own hand off shortly thereafter, and then is reduced to just hanging around the edges and turning to the judge for help. We have Weimark's judge, who's you know toasting exiled James III. I mean, it's interesting how we can be this figure of the status quo, yet also toasting the, the exiled king after the Glorious Revolution. He is also dismissive of everything that, that apparently is going on. He just doesn't believe it. But then when he does believe it, is the only one who can take care of it. But is so brutal in his methods, so brusque in his manner, he's simultaneously an utterly unsympathetic figure, but also the only one that people can turn to who might be able to get things done. And then we are left with this very ambiguous freeze frame of an ending after he has hoisted the demon behemoth on his presumably sanctified sword of some kind. It's probably Excalibur, the way it's been wrapped up and, and treated as some sort of holy relic. But we freeze frame on a close-up of his eye framed by flame. And so... If the Tygon executives thought that him slaughtering the entire village was too bleak, we certainly get an ending where we're not entirely reassured that everything is going to be okay now. 
Yeah, very, very strange vibe in this movie, which is what I like about it. Both because, like you mentioned, that strange meandering way that the plot moves where you don't know who the hero is. Imagery of like animals, like a crow and a snake, like as if we're supposed to understand what that means. The way the supernatural elements are just kind of occasionally weave in and out of the story. To me, it almost feels like it's a movie that like if a horror movie had been made in the 18th century, like I'm missing a key to it, which I, which I like, there's something very mysterious about it. Yeah. Jonathan Rigby has pointed out that it's sense of period without taking anything away from Witchfinder general is more convincing than that of Witchfinder general. This feels like a very lived in early 18th century. Uh, like you said, it feels like this could have been made in the 18th century. Yeah, everything is very dirty and lived in and grimy. And everything is so surrounded by nature. So many shots where the, the trees, branches are framing the action. Like we're looking through the branches at what's happening. The, the characters are constantly moving through these, these deep forests. We, we rarely get vistas, right? We do early on with the plowing of the fields, but in, in so much of the film, our vision is restricted by these trees. These ruins are, seem to emerge out of nowhere where the, the rituals are, are going to take place, suddenly they're there, right? We don't get a sense so much of a village as isolated homes in all of this deep, deep green. As, as some uh, critics have pointed out, there's, there's a somewhat Lovecraftian aspect to the way the evil propagates in that it's not one mean figure walking around, like, you know, let's say a vampire. Rather, it's, it's like the evil has emerged from the ground, but also pervades the ground. Anything can happen to anyone, anywhere in the film. There's no safe place to be, nowhere to turn. Uh, and the very nasty mechanism by which this, this demon is assembling its body by having patches of flesh torn off the bodies of its worshippers or its victims, uh, it doesn't seem to matter which. The Satan's Skin, which was the, the film's original title, spreads like a disease. Yeah, yeah which, there's a bit of body horror happening not just with the the fur but like initially with the clawed hand of uh the one lover who was taken away literally out of the film the the skin removal like the the clinical scene there's yeah there's an icky bit of uh focus on the scarring and the the dismemberment and the removal of tissue it it gets a bit more visceral than some of these other films it it does and the way it spreads is you can see it spreading like the sense of disease at that time, right? Where it's like, where mm. does this come from? It's it's invisible. It's not like, again, a zombie or a vampire where there's this, okay, there's a source of infection. You got bitten, yeah. right? How did that demon arm or the demon aspect wind up in the attic of that yeah. home? <laughs> uh, the, where did it disappear in, in the ground? Angel found a claw, but that eye, that skull thing has just disappeared. Right? Mm -hmm. How do the patches of fur start to show up? So it's as if the very air is poisonous and can take these characters down. Yeah. A fun little connection is that those ruins being overtaken by nature are just the same abandoned church that we have in the witches. It's uh, in a place called Bix Bottom. It's the same mm -hmm. location they use. Very cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. This seems like one aspect that uh, permeates later on. Uh, in some of the uh, films inspired by this is the the fear of youth. They're, they're such a treacherous band. Like they're so manipulative, uh, using their lures of evil and power and mischief. They're uprising and, and taking over. And I feel that's that's something that permeates later in a lot of films that look to Blood on Satan's Cause for influence. We could certainly look back to things like Village of the Damned as well. Right? Yeah. We have that, the fear of, of youth Mm -hmm. running throughout the 60s not necessarily just in horror films yes mm -hmm. right well heck we can go back to the 50s as well right but it's there and so i certainly would see blood on satan's claw as as a continuum of that yes. which uh yeah definitely we see a lot of in the 70s too it's true it very much puts it in its time definitely generational conflict is something we see in a lot of these and um i think that a lot of that has to do with there being obviously a huge countercultural movement in england at this time where young people were looking for new value systems but um it, it's interesting to try to decode which side of the generational conflict each uh, movie is going for um like i think the witchfinder general 
like um, Reeves' previous film, The Sorcerers, is very much on the side of the youth and very hopeless in it. The way it sees the older generation as inevitably crushing and co-opting uh, what the young people are trying to achieve and not letting them have this this freedom they want. But definitely this kind of battle between the older generation and the younger generation is something that I think is is motivating a lot of these movies. And I think Blood on Satan's Claw as far as the generational clash is concerned, has something of Wicker Man's pox on both your houses. Because mm. though the the youth here, yeah, they're the ones who are all in the demon cult and uh, the source of threats. The older generation, there's no prizes there either. There's not a single older character who is sympathetic. The young man's hideously disapproving. Aunt, the contemptuous of everybody but himself. Judge, the ineffectual curate trying to Im- impose his vision of morality uh, on the youth, the the squire who's just a, an absolutely ridiculous figure. I mean, there's nobody there that the film is siding with. In fact, the only sympathetic characters that we have are the young people prior to possession, right? But we see that they are being oppressed by that older generation. Mm-hmm. Is the film also giving us the, the possibility that we, we see in some others of the evil force taking over the younger people is the reaction to the oppression of the older generation. And, and you, you encourage them in this actively. It's most important that each new generation born on summer I'll be made aware that here the old gods aren't dead. And what of the true god, whose glory churches and monasteries have been built on these islands for generations past? Now, sir, what of him? Well, he's dead. He can't complain. He had his chance, and in modern parlance, blew it. We've already brought up The Wicker Man a number of times. Let's delve into it. <laughs> it's, it's an obscure film. So I, I feel like of all the films here, clearly no one else has seen it. It's, uh, you know, easily the least recognized. No, of course, the opposite is true. This is uh, an incredibly revered film, 1973. Uh, as directed by Robin Hardy from his screenplay by Anthony Schaefer, who was inspired by a novel he had read in 1967 uh, called Ritual. It's, it's a story of a ritualistic murder and wanted to make something that touched on that. So we have this um, ill-fated police sergeant, uh, Neil Howey, heads over to a very remote island, uh, Summer Isle, to investigate uh, the disappearance of a young girl based on uh, an anonymous letter that was sent to him saying that this uh, Rowan Morrison is missing and to uh, come help out. And very, he's a very devout Christian already, a very important factor coming in there and uh, is immediately unnerved first by just the attitudes of, of the people on this island, but then slowly but surely realizes that it's not just a uh, an embracing of unchristian attitudes but it's an island completely devoid of christianity which baffles howie and everywhere he goes be it the way they sing at the pub the way that they handle their veg and later the way in which they uh sacrifice things to pagan gods everything doesn't quite sit right with mr howie this film was uh, incredibly uh well received over time one of the hallmarks of that is just how many times it's been recut many a, a treasured film, your Blade Runners and what have you. We always want more editions of it. So there's the initial restoration. There's a U.S. version. There's a director's cut. There's the so-called final cuts. We've got variations of this film throughout time. It stars Christopher Lee, famously from all the Hammer films we had mentioned before, in what he considers to be his finest film amongst the uh, nearly, what is it, about 300 films? that he he managed to do and that's not counting of course his albums and his spoken word pieces and his heavy metal contributions and but this he considered his finest hour on film and indeed it is a wonderful thing to witness it uh, has an absolutely terrifying yet jubilant ending we have uh, rampant paganism throughout this but there's no real witchcraft as far as we know because there's no real proof of it it's all hinging on the idea that if they make a grand sacrifice then their harvest will improve and uh, because it hasn't before they must uh, make a human sacrifice and there's no evidence in the film to show that that is a true thing that there are in fact gods sitting there you know 
you know, shuffling their feet and tapping their fingers, awaiting the sacrifice in order to make their veg grow. It's, it's pointed out that they might just be trying to defy science as the fruits they're trying to grow there. Howie points out that they shouldn't be able to grow there. And that the reason that a lot of their fruits and veg are not growing is because they're not meant to grow on this type of island. But that does not stop them from dancing around the maypole and bringing him to the wicker man to uh, make a sacrifice. It's a very interesting uh, clash of Christianity and paganism. So without the supernatural elements, we don't have the Christianity trying to come and squash the witchcraft. There's no secret weapons that are brought in. It is just his faith and his faith is not a weapon. His faith is, in fact, the reason for his demise. All these key elements that they needed, they needed someone who was a, a virgin who uh, came willingly to this island, although that comes with a lot of asterisks as far as how he was very much tricked into this and was really brought into the situation where we have this old money couple running this island with these uh, pagan beliefs, these heathenistic views and they are trying to convey themselves as very compassionate people. But in fact, it's very much a uh, kind of a totalitarian figure running this this show. In, amidst all this jubilance is this grim belief that murder and death will, will bring them great fortune. It's a treasure trove of so many things to witness and see and experience. And all the while giving this uneasy feeling despite the fact that it's so bright and jubilant and and lovely yeah it really is one of the uh horrors by daylight uh films and Very most much. of the movie is is brightly lit and its most awful scene is during the day <laughs> during the day with additional lighting probably the biggest torch we've ever seen on cinema <laughs> <laughs> it, it just could not get brighter the very last shot is the sun itself and the pyre what you said about how revered it is, I think, highlights something interesting, too, with all three of the films that we're, we're talking about. Their position now is something that has been relatively long in coming. I mean, Witchfinder General is certainly a success uh, in its day. I think of the three, that was the biggest hit, as it were. But seeing the actual cut of Witchfinder General with the original score was something that we weren't able to do here legitimately until the 90s. Mm. Uh, few and far between were the home video releases of Blood on Satan's Claw. I mean, we finally got you know a beautiful Blu-ray restoration a couple of years ago. And The Wicker Man, you mentioned all the different ways in which it was cut. The fullest version of it, which has some pretty important scenes, particularly the prologue where we see Howie at mass before he comes to the island. But the original negative was ground up and sold for road filler. So, you know, and after 1974, the film slipped into obscurity and then its reputation kind of brought it back. But that's why we don't have a perfectly restored version of it, right? That when you see the, the extended cut, the, the restored scenes stand out in poorer picture quality because mm -hmm. the original negative is gone. Mm -hmm. So it now has the highest reputation of the three films, I think. But it's also the one that we don't have in a true, perfectly restored condition. And I believe when it was originally released, it was released as the B-movie on a double bill with Don't Look Now. It was, the, yeah. The Nicholas Rogue movie. And I don't think ever had a theatrical release in America. No, it was just tested at some drive throughs I think, because it was up to Corman to evaluate whether it would work in a U.S. market. And he uh, asked for additional cuts on top of the cuts that were already made to try and squeeze it into that double bill. That would have been a hell of a double bill to see, though. Yeah, it would have. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's really interesting that the pagan traditions we have on Summer Isle, they're not really traditions that have persisted. They've been purposely, inorganically grown by the lairds of this island, starting with Christopher Lee's grandfather. You know, They've planted these traditions like a, a heirloom crop. Like they've planted these crops they're trying to grow, which aren't native to the island. I mean, they seem to have intensely researched the ancient traditions but they haven't persisted they've implanted them it's the lord this powerful upper class figure who has placed these traditions among the people they're not actually persisting in the people organically i find that pretty interesting it, it is an interesting comment isn't it on coming back to what you're saying earlier about how much of the pagan tradition in the 20th century is in fact a recent 
invention, right? Or, mm. or cobbled together from all these other sources, but you know, very much like what we see in The Wicker Man. Yeah, another movie with such a strange, compelling vibe where uh, things that seem lighthearted and things that are deadly serious are not necessarily extricable. They kind of wind together in weird ways. Probably the, the most sinister musical yet created. <laughs> Which was also intensely researched, right, by Schaffer and Hardy to try to recreate some old folk songs and such. Drawing a lot from the, the the work of Cecil Sharp, who was like the founding father of the folk revival movement, one of the early figures who you know did field recordings and stuff. Well, it's the thing; it, it, it's all set around the policemen's arriving at the time of their biggest festival of the whole year. So, yeah, we're getting all the brightest costumes, and everyone's preparing, and even leading up to it, going to the one uh, druggist's shop, and it's just chocolate hairs everywhere. It's just such a happy, lovely place. Like they're preparing for you know their own Easter the May Day Festival, but they actually filmed the movie in October. Mm. So in some scenes, they had to glue like fake leaves and blossoms to the foliage to make it look more <laughs> spring-like. <laughs> it's one of these films that uh, when we think of all of these and, and what they, they led to, right? Uh, if we you know, look at their, their progeny, I mean, and as much as they insist that no, there is no connection, it's, it's hard not to see the Wicker Man's highest profile descendant being the Burning Man Festival. <laughs> uh, true yeah but in terms of of films if i look forward to the things like the blair witch project or the witch or other films that today we uh, think of as folk horrors the ritual and so forth drawing lines from them to blood on satan's claw is really easy and yet the uh, with the wicker man it's harder you know apart from its misbegotten remake <laughs> so or um, it, or Midsummer, I think, is one that you can draw very, very closely back to the Wicker Man. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think Midsummer is the true uh, and worthy inheritor of, uh, of of the Wicker Man's crown in, in that regard. So it's easily the most famous that we're looking at. That in the long run, it's had the the most incarnations on on video. Is the one that has the the highest profile, but is it necessarily the one that has the most cinematic airs? I'm thinking probably not, which is interesting. Tough act to follow. Mm -hmm. True that. So let's throw out something a little more fun to finish things off with. <laughs> uh, there was a movie uh, in 1974 released called Psychomania. What a title. There's so many great <laughs> titles here, right? Witchfinder yeah. General is an amazing title. Blood on Satan's Claw. So cool. Just great titles in this episode. Uh, Psychomania also released as the, the Death Wheelers in the U.S., <laughs> which gives you a little bit more of an idea of what it actually is, which is a biker folk horror. So it's a biker movie and also a folk horror movie at the same time, the crossover that you, you didn't know you needed. Um, directed by Don Sharp, who did several Hammer films, uh, written by Julian Zemet and Arnaud Dussault. Arnaud Dussault was, a, was an American who was a Hollywood screenwriter and a playwright who had been blacklisted. He re refused to answer questions to the Committee of Un-American Activities, but invited Senator McCarthy to have a private discussion about communism with him. So naturally, he never worked in Hollywood again <laughs> and, uh, and uh, ended up in Europe starring um, Nikki Henson. Nikki Henson also appears in Witchfinder General in a supporting role. Nicky Henson was actually an avid motorcyclist. He was really into that scene at the time. This is a very, obviously, very counterculture movie as, as being a biker occult film. Um, Nicky Henson said that when he got the script, he only needed to read the first page and know that he was doing it. The opening was eight chopped hog Harley Davidson's crest the brow of a hill. So he was obviously as a big biker was like, fuck yeah, can't wait to do this movie with eight glistening new Harley Davidson's showed up on set and saw that what they actually were using were eight dubiously maintained used bikes from the defunct British manufacturer matchless. <laughs> according to him they had eight mechanics on set the whole time because the bikes were constantly breaking down <laughs> and we also have george sanders who had a very long career in his final film performance a lot of final film performances here in this episode yeah i was and two suicides as well yeah i was uh, making notes about how cursed some of these films seem to be there's a lot of death and retirement uh, shortly after appearing or being a part of these films 
So, I mean, not to be superstitious, but... <laughs> but, uh, but you're going to be superstitious. I absolutely am going to be, especially since I, I mourn the death of George Sanders. He has what I consider to be one of the greatest voices in recorded cinema history, recording acting history. His his tone, his tenor is something that I would gladly place someone into a giant wicker pile and burn them alive if I could <laughs> then gain those vocal cords. Absolutely. And, and the fun thing that um, Gary Parsons pointed out to me is that in one of the witchcraft documentaries we're talking about, George Sanders does the voiceover. Awesome. So there's one more crossover. But yeah, absolutely wonderful, uh, wonderful voice. The story is a, a, a reckless biker gang harassing a village, though their leader, Nikki Henson's character uh, named Tom, he's part of some mysterious wealthy family whose mother and George Saunders' character named Shadwell, who's like a sort of a butler, but more than that, they dabble in the occult and have some connections to strange black magic. And Tom hatches a plot to commit suicide so that he can be revived as an immortal, which is a thing you can do, and convinces his whole gang to join him in this endeavor so that they can more effectively harass the village and get rid of the uh, the establishment, really. Literally, at one point, George Saunders says, you mean the entire establishment? That's, I guess, what they're going to do. But uh, a lot of fun and silliness ensues. I love when they go in town and just cause trouble. That whole scene of them just, like, removing pylons and stealing an ice cream cart and pinching the bottoms of fit young mums. It just... <laughs> Yeah, they yeah. sort of they're running low on things to do. <laughs> yeah. It's not so much, you know, atrocities that these undead are committing, it's shenanigans. <laughs> it's it's shenanigans, and yeah. They didn't become flesh eating zombies, they became unkillable twits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They push one guy off a ladder because he's just standing on top of a ladder in the middle of like an open courtyard for no reason. <laughs> no reason. He's yeah, just who's there on top of a ladder. Kind of asking for it. I mean, not to victim blame here, but yeah, standing on top of a ladder next to a bunch of boxes to catch his fall. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of surprised they didn't do the thing like two workmen carrying a giant pane of glass or maybe yeah. the budget didn't allow for a, a huge wedding cake that somebody could be pushed into. Yeah, exactly. Or driving their bikes through the supermarket. and uh, Yeah, that, which uh, is fun, uh, pushing the shelves yeah. over and everything. Well, and to come back to your point when, you know, how disappointed he was to the actual motorcycles, because, you know, it, it, like, well, they're a step up from scooters, maybe, but they're, they're, they're hardly intimidating visually, are they? Yeah. No, <laughs> not exactly. I mean, they do their best with the helmets, but oh, it the is, helmets are great. It does look like and the uh, enormous goggles they wear. Amazing yeah. fashion, <laughs> leather jackets with uh, with turtlenecks underneath, and then the, the skull and crossbow to helmets, the big goggles. They got their names on them. They they all have cool biker names like Hatchet and Chopped Meat. And then there's one <laughs> poor guy who's just named Bertram. I, I, feel, I feel sad for Bertram. <laughs> but uh, yeah, lots of fun stuff. The procession of suicides too, when he, he convinces his, his gang members to also commit suicide because all they have to do is just very much believe they will come back and they will. And they, then you have gags like a guy leaving his bike misparked so that he waits for a copper to come by and calls to him from a top floor of a window or, uh, you know, oh, you want me to come down, do you? Here I go. Just staging gigs to commit suicide. It's more of a rock and roll dark comedy than it is a horror film. It's very much about the pratfalls and the gags yeah. than any sort of dread. The climactic reveal of what happens to the bikers is a, is a horrifying image, but uh, there's a lot of lack of horror leading up to that point. It keeps an admirable sense of humor about the proceedings. You know, the Wicker Man, there's certainly a lot of wit in there. There's a lot of humor in the the early goings, but is ultimately a very serious film thematically and in, and in what it develops. Little by little, the laughs drain away. Whereas the Psychomania seems to be conscious of the fact that, well, it's never really going to be able to disturb you. So, you know, these are the motorcycles that we got. So let's have some fun with this. Yeah. And it's, it's not in this episode for no reason, too. There are actually a surprisingly a lot of these uh, folk horror elements and references to some weird pagan beliefs. We have the megaliths in the, in the field with a mysterious backstory. The frogs that are some sort of like deity or there's some sort of black magic attached to, to the frogs, which is something you see in witchcraft a lot. So there, there is a lot of these elements uh, drawn from paganism that are used kind of interestingly. There was something I was trying to suss out a bit in um, so many things that I was reading about it. It seemed like a lot of people couldn't decide whether they were making a pact with Satan 
or just a frog god. And it's different from the other ones, too, in that we have a much stronger urban presence, or at least we have a more paved over nature, given all the motorway stuff. So we, we kind of move back and forth between the, the scenes with the standing stones and the, the foggy fields and the more urban settings for the shenanigans. Mm hmm. And in terms of the generational conflict, well, we have a, a lot of fun with the young characters, and some of them are occasionally viewed kind of sympathetically. It, the movie does seem to be ultimately pretty scared of the youth. In this yeah, so our older generation are practicing black magic and uh, have butlers who might be a demon. So. Yeah. <laughs> I love his funeral when he dies and they have the hippie funeral where the bikers are like <laughs> making flower upright. garlands. Yeah, he's like like he's taxidermied or something. He's sitting upright on his bike in this, yeah. this <laughs> giant deep grave. Somebody's singing a folk song uh, for a really long time. It's yeah, it's really fun. The music is actually awesome in this movie. I really enjoy the music. Mm -hmm. It's a cool movie. Can't take that away from it. Oh, it's cool for sure. Yeah, absolutely cool. Well... I guess we should wrap things up here then. We've got through five uh, pretty interesting and entertaining movies. We've considered folk horror rather narrowly in the sense of British movies from the late 60s and 70s, but you could also take the term into more expansive places. And um, if you do so, you can see that there's been a lot of movies recently that seem folk horror-ish. So this is by no means a dead genre. It might be one which is just coming back to life in a big way. Even witchcraft itself is like really resurging in a lot of ways. Uh, worth mentioning too is uh, Severin's recent uh, All the Haunts Be Ours collection of folk horror movies. It's a beautiful set. It has the aforementioned Woodland Stark and Days Bewitched documentary and then 19 feature films from around the world. Canada is represented by Clear Cut. And you've got a 150-page book uh, with essays on the phenomenon, too. So it, it's kind of one-stop shopping for a kind of global and historical perspective of folk horror. Nice. Fantastic. And I suppose the, there's also uh, Adam Scoville's book, Folk Horror, Hours Dreadful and Things Strange, which has been quite influential. And shout out to all the folk metal musicians out there. Keeping uh, keeping the pagan tradition alive and keeping it heavy and evil. The Corpa Clowney, look it up, kids. Speaking of books to look out for, do you have anything um, recently released, David? Yeah, just in the stores uh, last month is my second Doctor Doom novel, Reign of the Devourer, which I'd say it's pretty much folk horror in the way that uh, things uh, play out in that. I uh, have a novella in the Harrow Deep collection from Black Library, and you can now pre-order my forthcoming Arkham Horror novel in the Coils of the Labyrinth. Ah, great. Well, David Annadale, thank you so much for uh, joining us for another episode. Thanks so much for having me. Always a pleasure. And Will, thanks once again. Aw, oh, shucks. Thank you, Dylan, for uh, always uh, assembling these uh, amazing episodes. Oh, you. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, if you like the episode, you know, uh, subscribe, comment, uh, share, whatever you feel like. Anything that the algorithm or the old gods will be pleased by. We're going to be back very soon with a, uh, a new episode that's going to be about found footage horror from 1998 to 2008. We're going to take you on a very jittery, nauseating journey from the Blair Witch to Cloverfield. So look out for that soon. Just subscribe if you don't want to miss it. Thanks again, guys. This has been super fun. Have a, have a good night, everyone. Keep looking behind you. Hashtag witch talk is huge. There's so many people. There's so many like 18 year old witches out there now. Absolutely. All over the place. Well, as long as our veg keeps coming and we'll be fine. <laughs>